between October 2013 and September 2014, in the quiet, family-oriented town of Eagle River, Alaska, two daughters would be murdered and their bodies driven around for hours before being recovered, less than a half a mile away from each other. Welcome to True Crime 49. Waking up, she finds her eyes already open, staring a hole through the world. There had been another world, Georgia. The name like a shot in the vein. The heart races with excitement. Then it takes a hit as the memories catch up to the heartstrings, reminding them, "Remember." There's always a spot where, if you could stop the clock right there, everything was still okay. And as that spot flies by, the mind becomes more godlike. It breathes in its flaring nostrils and runs like a horse out of sight. There's a solitude man still running in the desert. His pace, a staccato stumbling, eyes death locked on the horizon. What is she doing right now? She awakes and finds her eyes already open, staring through the world, shame. It's a beautiful morning. Eagle River flows today like the breeze that whistles through the old Colosseum, the arena long quiet, a skeleton asking you to imagine the things that he has seen. Ice was once over eighteen hundred feet deep, right here where you are standing. The volunteer dad reads the trail sign at the nature center. Most kids look up at the near vertical tops of the giant walls around them, like skyscrapers of stone broken off, and leaving piles of stone ball bearings and smooth cast-off, immeasurable. The river gathers rainwater and runoff and sells trinkets to the passerbys. The glacier, a half a mile thick, is gone. Before dawn, the sun is hidden from the wall of mountains. Deep blue light. But the sky is alpenglow, pink, orange, coral, cotton candy, and the river pours by the town and looks wild and mighty still. And in the shadows, it slips out of sight, down into the back dagger sleeve of the military base, unseen by the common man again. In Eagle River, when the sun breaks over the mountain, it can be blue forever. Then instantly, you are bathed in light. Like there's a search beacon shining directly on you from two thousand feet up, atop the old glacier's beaches, where up there the wind has blown the sand down into the canyon, a long, long time ago. Hiding a secret from him still, he'd made it home through the desert and bravery it took, when she had to give up that first look into his eyes. Strange, the oasis is still just out of reach for him, as he is hallucinating, dried and failing, at the edge of the waters, trying to smile for her. Every day the same. Before dawn, the sun is hidden from the wall of mountains. Waking up, she finds her eyes already open, deep blue, forever. And then the room is bathed in light. And it seems to be happening faster and faster. He will be going to the airport tonight, only for a relative. He'll be away from the house for a little while. Plus, he knows. I haven't been feeling very well. When he arrives home, having just come from seeing someone you haven't seen in a while, it conjures up parts of the old you, even parts of all the other yous you've been along the way. Much easier to make conclusions, judgment clearer now, and then he's instantly baffled when he sees still a drip run down from the tub that looks closer, and sees watered blood still slowly moving down into the tub. He confronts her. All of the bad daydreams are back, 
and he had carved the stories into whale's teeth and ivory, scrimshaw, all of the things she might be doing this very instant. It is almost unbearable how the needle spins from north to the new north, but no wait, we are truly confused all along our anchor was made of shifting sand. The bad daydreams of what is she doing right now, February, in Georgia. Bad daydreams playing on loop, all of a sudden around him, here back in the States even now, and then he catches it. The hidden key, the words have been changed. The bad dreams are saying she did something back in Georgia. Then why is there blood in the tub in Eagle River, Alaska, this fine October evening? Ashley Ard was born December 27, 1988 in Virginia and was a specialist in the U.S. Army. In September 2013, she reported to the U.S. Army-Alaska Joint Base Elmendorf-Richardson. Specialist Ard, along with her daughter and her husband, also in the Army, settled in Eagle River, Alaska. The military describes Eagle River as the best of both worlds kind of place. A military-friendly community that has many attributes that make it a favorite among military families. She has a change of plans. Adapt. As the glacier is collapsing and tumbling down on you. 911. Something has happened to my wife. The music for the rescue squad scratches hastily off the needle when the EMTs looked up at each other and spoke in dolphin mind talk to each other. And the wave moved through the medical responders one by one. The theme music was over. A kid was sweeping up peanut shells already and shrugging his shoulders, the squad shuffling away, like a swole-necked deer. Having sniffed the ass of the trooper's decoy, snapped back and looking around. They had showed up to the wrong crime scene. The dog's eyes were partially open. One was surely half stuck or something as he was jostled for a walk at this hour. The man needed that light and it was just about to break over the mountains and shine a spotlight into those bushes from last night. I couldn't sleep a wink the sound I heard in the bushes. Maybe it was nothing. We'll see. He tugs the dog along. You can piss later, up at the park. The sun was beating him there, coming across the grass and the treetops. And it got there first, just before him, standing, pointing, see, under the brush. It's a blank. The haunting voice calling out last night, obscured by the heavy steel electric thing buzzing. But it wasn't close enough to get any heat, though. He pulled the blanket back a bit. What, are you kidding me? I needed more time before I saw her. I wasn't ready. I'll never be ready. You never heard the one about the nun opening the door at the church and finding a baby? Well, she wasn't going to go that way. She was like the doe deer, on the wing, leaping over tangled messes. Her fortress to pick and choose from in the forest, wherever to land the best advantage. She was going to slip through the gap, cut it close, sacrifice of herself, and clear the end gap right up to the end. The police are just outside. I told them that we were fine, but I don't think they can understand me. They are repeating your name over and over like a stout calf, thirsty calling out for his mama. A baby girl later named Parker was born in the bathtub to specialist Ashley Ard on the 9th of October 14th, 2013. Ashley had kept her pregnancy a secret from her husband, who was not the father. Although Alaska has many safe haven locations that allow parents to give up their child, Ashley wrapped her hours-old baby in a towel, leaving her under a bush at a park around 1 a.m. The average October temperatures in Eagle River, Alaska, 
are a high of 44 degrees and a low of 30. A local resident walking his dog discovered the unresponsive baby and reported to the police at 9.34 a.m. the following morning. Medics called to the home of the Ards, treated Ashley for injuries consistent with delivering a baby. Law enforcement was notified by the responding EMT. Miss Brown now goes about her business, answering legal documents from the new good man's name. She gets the good yogurt now. Daughter's playing kid games with the nice car door propped open. Meanwhile, they're laughing and carrying on. Lawyers for the now remarried Ashley Brown say she was not aware of the safe havens and did not want the child to die. Ashley said herself, I would like you to know that Parker losing her life was not intentional. Prosecutors noted that in addition to not caring for the infant, Ashley placed the baby in a remote location and did not make any attempts to get aid. Ashley Brown was sentenced Wednesday to nine years in prison for the death with an additional five years of supervised release. She will be eligible for parole in six years. The girls in the call center do funny things to break the monotony. They give names to the different voices their co-workers make, depending on who they're talking to. Everyone knows that when Esther uses her big mama voice, somebody is racking up a devastating tab. When an actual person comes in, it's worse. A married woman had to hand off forms over the counter to a very nice young man. She came out of the kiosk and pointed towards her call cubicle and she stopped in her tracks. All the ladies were looking at her and raising an eyebrow or smirking. She's blushing so instantly and strongly that everyone is shocked for a minute. It's as if they'd walked in on her. Luckily, Verna comes from the back out of nowhere and blinking her eyes slow like honey. Bye! And she swatted the woman on the bottom. They all laughed like a group of kids, standing awkwardly among discarded bicycles in the center of the kid, nearly just crushed by a welder struck. It wasn't until after they had all went back to work, dabbing a laugh tear from their eye that one by one they remembered she had taken that call last week, and it must have gutted her. She hadn't quite pulled out of it for days, day in, day out, this same old thing. You gotta do things to break the monotony. She's clicked in, back in the saddle. 911, what's your emergency? There is no voice on the other end. Rustling and muted, the speakers clear for a moment, breathing open air for a taste and click. Deadline. There are protocols for things like this. In the dark of night, is there a glowing bloom of algae? Calls in the neighborhood that you'd better get down here? So far, nothing in the dark. Same number, same thing. There are protocols for things like this. Hang up number three gets a dispatch. It is the information age, a mammoth cave of endless caverns. We squint our ears like bats and get only what we can as we fly by, flashing a tiny sonar bulb. But if you could see it all at once, like midday, the connections of information made already. The girl who owns this phone has a restraining order out on her ex. As the officer is pulling into the neighborhood, the algae bloom takes off in the dark. Disturbances in the water around the girl with the phone. He's probably here. The headlights pull up across the front of the place, and he comes running out, pale, wild-eyed, smudges of blood, multiple cuts up his arms with scissors held out in front of him. This officer is the first wave from hang-up number three. A few blocks out is backup originating from the next hang-up and a larger ring still minutes away a black heavy armored diesel is heading in from hang up number five. And everyone is expecting something big. First wave, small talk, deploy the taser, ineffective. Second wave, right into the fray. Mr. Thomas is scratching out his voice, a meth throat plateau where your vocal cords twist and force you appear to be transitioning into an animal. The moonlight sees the bullet zip through the air and out into the night. 
into free flight, ineffective. He is an animal. Flashbang device turns him into a low-impact roadkill, eyes, ears trembling in the presence of God. The next taser hits wet tissue, and they light him up. He is reduced back to the moment of his conception, writhing out of the water, flapping on the deck towards the light, the moist life. She is terrified and numb, both at the same time. You turn off the juice. He is cuffed up. He is secretly loving every moment of it. He hides it every day and has to smile in their fucking faces. He can see how satisfying it would be to smear their slimy lips off to the side. He gave them a taste of it. She caught him at his weakest moment and she used it against him. He's growling and gnashing his teeth. When he sees her watching, the animal turns teary-eyed and cries out, I'm going to kill myself. Why did you do this to me? Baby, I love you. The trees were still warm in the dark. Blue lights leaving one by one, the neighborhood quieted down. The forest slowly giving back the sun's heat from the day. And the angel of death was out late, moving along the trees in the fence line. He tracked down the bullet lodged in the roof of a doghouse one block over. A missed opportunity, I guess. He'll have to bring flowers next time. It's too bad. He pats the dog's head. You are a lucky boy. David Joseph Thomas, born June 30th, 1986, was convicted of assaulting a police officer in Montana. On January 29th, 2007, David Thomas, then 20, violated a no-contact order granted to his former girlfriend, who he shares a child with, by arriving at her residence. Several hang-up calls were made to 911 and officers were dispatched. Thomas threatened to kill officers, lunging at them with scissors. He was then tased, and at one point, Thomas threw an object at the police who fired a shot at him, missing. A flashbang was used, followed by tasing to subdue and handcuff Thomas. Thomas, who pled guilty in a plea agreement, was sentenced to seven years with four years suspended and ordered to pay restitution to his former girlfriend for damages to her apartment. He took a nice store clerk and harnessed him onto a crane hook. It would look like a magic show. The clerk a volunteer from the audience. The crane is idling, the smokestack harmonizing it all down to a pop, pop. The arm goes up into the glinting sky and drops down this thick steel cable. Everyone is anticipating. Pop, pop, pop. The throttle opens. The motor is instantly producing thousands of horsepower. Black smoke billowing out of the smokestack. The line withdraws and the clerk is zipping vertically. Actually a lot slower than he'd expected. The way the motor had revved up, he was frightened at first then chuckles as he was still close to the people, rising slowly. They all chuckled together, then he's above them, the rooftops. Third world bird's nests, always a stranded toy, sun bleached and rigid above the rooftops. Alone with the metal cable, he can hear the rumbling of the distant motor, the clicking of the valves inside the engine, popping of tension in the spool. The motor winds down and the cable slows to a stop then swings him slowly out to his left, over the parking lot below, the caged vans, over the outer fences, over the main wall between Tower 3 and 4, over the yard in the penitentiary, the convicts gathering and jeering at him. The world looks much different in here than out there. The cable begins to lower. The clerk is going crazy now, and rightfully so. To many of the men below him, the world looks the same out here as it does in there. Let's describe a few recognized traits. Never develops a conscience. Self-centered, impulsive, irresponsible, lack of guilt. Able to gain trust and exploit people. Defective relationships. These things festering and refining in jail. The clerk is reeled in and is unharnessed in front of the people. He describes the world he saw. It was horrible, he said. The rats were able to run amongst their feet, up their trousers, freely through the holes in their hearts and in their minds. Any impasse, a certain fight to the death. 
Imagine the games they play with each other in there. An old crook once said to me, Check out that San Quentin pigeon. I looked over and saw a young girl walking back from her mailbox down the alley behind his shop. It was a sour joke. Judged inaccurately, he'd never do something like that around here. See, the pigeon can be folded and tucked in your sleeve. They can't move until you let them out. Mr. Thomas is 28 years old now. He walks past the cages and reaches into his pocket for the key ring, eyes doing a quick look around. He opens the door and holds the kitten up, and the siblings are all reaching up, asking if they could be first. The pet store is a perfect place for the predator. A lot of our customers say hello and bye before they leave. Kind of like the old-fashioned livery stable. You can buy two pounds of dried cow strips, a 50-pound bag of dog food, and some heart dewormer. Hoisting your goods on your shoulder, you feel like spitting in a spittoon as you go out. Rubber shoe chains, tinging like the spurs. There are a lot of regulars. They bring in their pets. This is the creature that will bark at 3.30 in the morning to alert his owners. And once a week, Mr. Thompson is tantalizing him with bacon-flavored snacks, making sure he's licking the oily crumbs from his fingers, the dog whimpering. Many irons in the fire, but this new girl started working in the pet store. She's 19. Sweetest little thing. Coveted find. Linda Ann Martz Bauer graduated from Chugiak High School in 2013. She had a love for animals, getting a job at a local pet store, and applying at a well-known veterinarian clinic. While reptiles are phobias for others, Linda's gentle soul counted them amongst her favorites. Her love for animals, beautiful voice, and sweet nature made her seem like a modern-day Snow White. Things were going so well, but then she started causing problems. He couldn't believe it when she broke it off. Excuse me? All the level one tricks were played out. He had misjudged it. She isn't coming back, so he goes for broke, the last ditch. If you don't come over, I'm going to kill myself. And there are seeds he'd planted hidden in the stories he told. Small points of note seemed out of tempo at the time, but come back subconsciously now. All the evil trickery tugging on the strings of a gentle heart, calling out like a lamb stuck needing to be let down. It worked. She's coming over, but only under certain conditions, right? Yes, of course. She saw through his drama and was there only because he'd said he was going to kill himself. So, he was sure he could still put her in the pocket, but she wouldn't go. It began to happen all at once, unraveling so quickly he is standing in the sun saying something about his car over there. What was that? The brother's face is changing a multitude of expressions. He's telling his brother that he had strangled her last night and has been driving around for a few hours with her in the back of the car. Linda had broken up with Thomas the day before. His behavior had become erratic and dangerous in the weeks prior. She was at a friend's home when Mr. Thomas repeatedly called and texted her, saying he would commit suicide if she did not come to see him. Upon arriving, Mr. Thomas recounts that he had been drinking and that they were going to watch movies together. He states that he blacked out, coming to in his bedroom with his hands around young Linda's throat. He then says he came to hours later with her dead body in his Mercedes. He proceeded to drive around for hours before confessing to his brother, who called the police. Thomas surrendered to the police in the Eagle River Walgreens parking lot around 10.30 p.m. with Linda's body in the back seat. The plea deal Thomas pled guilty to was a 75-year sentence with 25 suspended and 50 to serve. Given that one-third of the sentence can be forgiven for good behavior, Thomas could be out on parole in 14 years. Find us online at TC49 Podcast. See show notes for more information.